five, four, three, two. That's a fast countdown. The first and perhaps only great mayor was Kwame Kilpatrick of Detroit. He said, all things good of this earth flow into my pockets because of the city's greatness. Were we not great once? Can we not be great again? I feel that this city is going to explode. I am talking guns. I am talking corruption. It all began with text messages. This is an incident that will not go away. Not as long as I am mayor of this city. You answer the rocket. You It's gone. What are, you, what are you doing? What are you doing? That is not paid for by them. That is paid for by the people of Detroit. You have to be qualified in there. I'm not qualified for this job. Let me tell you something. You want to go right now? Okay? You want to go right now? Hey, kids. It's your old pal, ML Elric. And I, I have to start the show with a little disclaimer because I'm not really big on milestones. I don't celebrate my, uh, my birthday or anything like that. And I didn't want to mark the 15th anniversary of the text message scandal, but Sean insisted. As as you know, Sean cannot get enough of the Kwame Kilpatrick story. So, Mark, I hope the bell is ready and well-rested. This episode, we're talking about Kwame Kilpatrick, 15th anniversary of the text messages, but not because it's the 15th anniversary, but because Kwame Kilpatrick has been claiming that he is a changed man, that he is... KK 2.0. And so we are joined today by someone who knows almost as much about Mr. Kilpatrick as I do. I knew you were going to say that, and I was hoping you wouldn't, but that's okay. Mr. Sean Windsor. No, no, Sean doesn't know anything about Kilpatrick because it's <laughs> it's it's relevant, interesting news. He just knows about... Uh, Your glasses. That's That was the big topic on Sean's mind. Oh, I like the started. intro, by the way. The, the first few notes I thought were uh, aliens... And then I realized it was Shawshank Redemption, but then you had Al Pacino, so it was a nice mix. Who ah? It was City Hall. A movie no one has heard of or seen. Yes, uh, a John Cusack star vehicle in which he gets to test out his uh, big, easy accent because he's a graduate of Tulane Law who goes to advise the mayor of, I think, New York, who's caught up in some sort of scandal, none of which is relevant. So we're going to get right to Mark Chutko, former federal prosecutor, assistant U.S. attorney, who was uh, one of the leaders of the efforts to bring Mr. Kilpatrick to justice. So Mark is kind enough to join us today to talk about the real Kwame Kilpatrick, which surprisingly is not the same as the real Kwame Kilpatrick that the real Kwame Kilpatrick claims is the real Kwame Kilpatrick. And if that doesn't make sense, I suggest you send a text message to Mark Fellhauer, who can make sense of it all, because that's what he does here for us. Okay. And I'll delete it. Oh. Thanks for coming in, Mark. I hope. I hope. I'm just that, getting to our guest. Yeah, I hope they're <laughs> reaching you on Skytel. And all of this is brought to you Skytel. by Luke Nowacki and by David Hall of Hall Financial. Two men, two businesses who can help you not only succeed financially in the present, but prepare for financial success in the future. We're going to be telling them, telling you a little bit about them after we hear about uh, the real Kwame Kilpatrick, which, by the way, led to my return to Fox 2. This is the second time this year I appeared on Fox 2, so we'll we'll play a little bit of that for you. Um, that's probably about as much of me as Fox 2 wants in any given year, but it was great to be back on the air talking about a subject we know so well. Last call, by the way, for Clark Park. If you want to support Clark Park and the kids of Southwest Detroit, we will have a link on our website, which is mlsolvedetroit.com, to our patronicity fundraiser where you can make a donation. And if you make a donation you will be invited to a exclusive whiskey tasting in Eastern Market. Uh, if you give, I will give you the details on how to join us there. It's a great time for a great cause. And, um, and the other way to support the show and good causes is to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is ML Soul of Detroit. Uh, we do tend to stop the live broadcast before we get to Room 7609. So if you're listening at home and you're listening exclusively to us, you will find a special feature this month on Room 7609 that we will talk about a little later in the show. So, Mark, it's great to have you here. Um, great to be here. We, uh, we're not joined by Kwame Kilpatrick. I don't know how to reach him now, 
but I imagine <laughs> if uh, if I had a lot of money to give somebody, he would find me. He's probably going to be listening, so I hope get so. Some note from him. Yeah, no, I, I hope so. If, if uh, We do encourage people to donate to the show. I don't think that's why he's listening. He's more on the receiving end of the donor-recipient uh, continuum. But uh, but he says he's a changed man, and uh, that's, that's one of the things that um, I find really hard to believe. Uh, you reviewed the federal filings. Uh, how, does it, how is it that he says he's a new man? I don't know. The uh, filing didn't seem to represent the guy that I knew. And uh, just like you, I read all of his text messages, um, probably 300,000 text messages total. So I really got a feel for who he was. And, um, you know, he claims that he's uh, become a new man, that uh, he's been introspective in prison, but uh, seems like the same guy that entered prison eight years ago. So... You know, he he really hit the jackpot when uh, President Trump released him, commuted his uh, sentence at the end of his administration. And uh, you would have thought that he would have been thankful and quiet and just hoped that uh, everyone would go away and just leave him alone so he could start his new life. But uh, it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, You know, the jackpot wasn't enough for him. So he wanted to reduce his uh, term of supervised release. And, um, you know, when you look at the filing itself, it seems that uh, his request is really a pretext for something else. So he he's saying that he had restrictions on his travel, and that was why he needed to reduce his supervised release, because uh, he couldn't travel out of uh, Georgia. But in fact, his uh, probation officer was granting every uh, request for travel that he made, so that the didn't seem like that that was something that was really hindering his ability to lead his life and that's interesting it seems like he would want to travel for another grift i mean that's kind of what it what it feels like you might be getting to here another way to separate people from their money yeah well he certainly wanted to travel to florida because that was where um he had started some kickstarter account to get uh, a new home in the orlando area that was uh, supposedly a gated community and um, started that effort until he realized that the uh, federal government wanted its money back. And is he, did, bra- is he brazen or is he stupid? Did he think people weren't going to catch on to that or see that? Did he think the courts weren't going to see that? I don't know. I mean, he just keeps on pushing and pushing until he gets his way. You know, um, we've seen politicians do that in the past, and uh, that seems to be his modus operandi. So here, I, I, I think that. Uh, you know, pretextually, he said that it was his restrictions on travel that was the reason for to reduce the supervised release. But I think it really had to do with money because with him, it always has it to do with money. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, here with a uh, supervised release, he had the federal government like poking in on his finances. And uh, that's not good for him. I mean, he wasn't able to continue his Kickstarter collection for uh, his new house. And so you can bet your bottom dollar that a year from now, once supervised release is over, that Kickstarter account will be funded again. (laughs) Yeah, There's a pattern here, and I I think what he does is he pushes as as hard as he can until somebody checks him, and he's owed the city of Detroit almost a million dollars for 15 years, and the Wayne County prosecutor seems to have made very little effort whatsoever to try and recoup that money. Now, after he was convicted of multiple counts of public corruption in 2013, the feds put a restitution order on him. I think the SEC's after him, too, the IRS. And, of course, there's what he owes for the corruption from the City Hall uh, criminal enterprise. And he was pretty much didn't have to make any payments because he was behind bars. Once he gets out, he starts trying to make some money. And I think he presumed that the feds would be just as derelict as the, uh, as the Wayne County prosecutor or whoever handles restitution for Wayne County. But, uh, but Mark's successor in the public corruption unit, David Gardy, and some of those folks, they get pretty angry when somebody owes the public a lot of money and pretends that they don't and then gets out of a gated community that we were paying for and then wants to move into another gated community and expects us to pay for it. Well, it's one thing if the first gated community is prison. It's another thing if the second one is some posh digs in Orlando that is probably nicer than anybody he left back home in Detroit can call home. It's just, I mean, he, he says he's a changed man, but I, I've seen no evidence of it. I, you know, I mean, you've read the text messages. What, what, it, 
what could possibly be different about this man? Yeah, I, I go back to uh, your case uh, when you when you uh, uh, got the text messages and sort of spurred the Wayne County prosecution. And, uh, you know, uh, we followed that whistleblower trial um, involving uh, Gary Brown and Harold Nelthrup uh, very closely. And um, throughout the whole thing, he not only denied that he had had an affair, but also denied that he had fired Gary Brown. And lo and behold, there's a text message that says to Christine Beatty, um, remember when we fired Gary Brown? And, uh, you know, I, I think to this day, if you were to ask him if he fired Gary Brown, he would say no. I mean, the text messages don't lie. They basically were, you know, his thoughts from his brain to his thumbs to sending it to uh, his colleagues. And uh, they, they basically formed the basis for the federal prosecution, too. And, you know, we went through six months of trial. We had uh, 24 of 30 counts uh, of conviction beyond a reasonable doubt by perhaps the most uh, diverse federal jury that uh, the Eastern District has ever known. And yet he's saying that none of it ever happened. I mean, he was there every single day, uh, wearing a different suit every single day, by the way. Um, I don't know how he had that many clothes for a six-month trial. I think he did recycle the burgundy velvet blazer, because I think I saw that more than oh, once. Oh, that, that was more than once? Yeah, I never really noticed it, but... Uh, um, it was my, very plush. My, my colleague, uh, Jen Blackwell, at one point pointed out about three months into the trial that he had not worn the same outfit twice. And, you know, the rest of us who were public servants like him, I had five suits from Joseph A. Banks that, you know, I cycled through each week and I knew exact, you know, I had different ties maybe. But uh, then I started watching. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're right. He really does have an endless supply of clothing. Where is he possibly purchasing that? Uh, Those are things that I think juries notice. They probably thought to themselves, you know, I don't have that many clothes. Uh, How is it possible that a public servant does? But getting back to my point is that, uh, you know, he had an opportunity during that trial to contest uh, the allegations against him. Uh, He sat there for six months watching the endless supply of audio tapes and text messages and uh, witnesses and his own colleagues, uh, administration officials, uh, testify under oath. And when he had the opportunity to testify himself in his own self-defense, he, he declined. Uh, here's what I give him credit for, though. He, he knows the game is really played with the public, and that's why he can say, yeah, I admit to the adultery, because that's what most people are going to focus on. I mean, the public, they love sex. Money, they love that those kind of stories, too, but it can get really complex as to what – what are RICO charges? I mean, that kind of goes over everybody's head. So he can go out there and said, yeah, I did this. Is 28 years worth it? I'm a new man. And he, I think he believes that people will accept that. The problem is he should know better that a court wouldn't accept that. Do you, do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I, I don't know where he's coming from, where he only uh, will acknowledge his, uh, you know, his uh, philandering of his wife because, uh, you know, that wasn't anything to do with the trial that we yeah, had. We yeah. we basically removed all that stuff. In fact, didn't want to pollute the jury by talking about any of that kind of information. So, um, so he, 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 it was established beyond any doubt that he had committed these crimes and everyone knew it in the courtroom. Um, ML, you were there, you knew it. Um, he was the only one that didn't. Um, you don't hear Bobby Ferguson going out there and claiming that he was innocent. I think he probably knows better than that. But Kwame Kilpatrick, for whatever reason, does not want to be looking like he was uh, unfaithful to the city of Detroit. He's, he was only unfaithful in his, in his marriage, apparently. Well, somebody did ask him uh, what happened, what brought him down. Mark, we've got some sound from when he was on the Today Show talking about basically what he thought he was guilty of. 2008, um, you know, it was revealed that, that uh, my tremendous character flaw and lying and manipulating of my own wife and family with having an adulterous relationship was put out in the public. And I had to protect my family and my then wife. It was tough. What a hero. Yeah, no, he, he protected the family and the wife that he betrayed. But, you know, the thing is, he's been playing this same note for all these years, thinking that people will forgive adultery, which, you know, however you feel about that, that's up to you. My, my approach to covering these stories is screw whoever you want, just don't screw the taxpayers. But the truth of it is what Mark said a moment ago. He fired a cop who was doing his job. He ruined the careers of a couple of police officers who were among the best in the department, who were working hard to serve the people of Detroit. He did all kinds of things that had nothing to do 
with sex. That lawsuit, that whistleblower lawsuit, the reason why Gary Brown and Harold Neltrup were awarded millions of dollars by a jury was because he destroyed their careers. They were whistleblowers trying to tell the authorities what was going on. And frankly, he was so dumb about it that Gary Brown would have taken his job back if he'd given it to him. If he'd put him in charge of the parking department, which he ended up being in charge of eventually, he would have said, just get me back on track to get my full pension and, and we'll never talk about this. But but this whole, this bravado, this feeling that uh, come and get me, we're going to say and do whatever we want until somebody comes and gets us, that plays sometimes in the court of public opinion, but in the actual court, it doesn't go very far. And Judge Nancy Edmonds, who was the one who sentenced Mr. Kilpatrick to 28 years in prison, was very succinct and was to the point when she said, listen, uh, you know, you're out there saying that, that, uh, that you're a new man. You've never admitted to what you did wrong. And we heard that on the Today Show as well. Yeah, I got to say that uh, – oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I, I think we're going to – Mark, do you have that yep. – Queued up. I so, did the perjury, you know. But all of this mail fraud, wire fraud, anybody that's conspiracy, conspiracies, um, absolutely not. Twenty four counts. <laughs> Twenty four counts of federal charge. And you still maintain that you were innocent of, of the overwhelming majority of, of those charges. Absolutely. <laughs> that must piss you off because you gave the opening statement and you pointed out wire wire transfers, right? Isn't that the wire fraud? Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we had his bank records. You could see all the uh, piles of cash that he would um, put into his bank account, his credit card accounts, uh, month by month as he does that was anger there. Does that anger you when you hear something like that, or do you say, that's that's this guy? He's just a criminal who won't admit to anything. Yeah, he seems undeterrable, unfortunately. Huh. Yeah, no, he, um, <laughs> he, he again, as, as he did with his text messages, testified against himself in this case. <laughs> The judge said that Kilpatrick's own recent statements to the media belie the assertion that he unequivocally accepts responsibility for his criminal conduct. He says this in a sworn document. I accept responsibility. Here he is on the Today Show not even a year ago saying, I didn't do it. I mean, does he think that Judge Edmonds doesn't watch TV, that somebody who watches TV isn't going to call Judge Edmonds? Can you, can you believe what this screwhead is saying on national TV now? I mean, it's just the man's... You know, his well, to, wife divorced him, but he's divorced from reality. To that point, how how does it work? Did he know he was going to get Judge Edmonds, or is that just no, a roll it's of a, dice? No, it's a random draw. So he, once that happened, he had to have known there was no way she was going to grant this. Well, um, you know, she did grant a uh, compassionate release to Bobby Ferguson to try to even the scales there yeah. when uh, when I'm sure uh, she Kilpatrick was that, released. But yeah. After well, but day. I mean, that showed fairness on her part. She didn't Bobby. have to do that, but she saw that uh, Bobby Ferguson, the number two guy um, serving 21 years in prison while um, because he didn't have that connection to Donald Trump, um, didn't seem fair to her in the scheme of things with uh, Kwame Kilpatrick out and starting his new life in a gated community. So, um, you know, she she followed the law in terms of the COVID um, and some of the health problems that uh, Bobby Ferguson claimed, but ultimately I think some of it had to do with the fact that she was trying to be even-handed in the logic of the case and didn't want to see one guy serving a lot longer sure. than the other. Yeah, and, and the sentences, the minute Kilpatrick's released, the sentences are immediately disproportionate because yeah. Ferguson served more time than Kilpatrick, even though he got less time than Kilpatrick. So as, as we've said on this show, you know, it just kind of, you know, once they let Kilpatrick out, you should probably let Bobby out too. And, and, and Bobby in talking to uh, Teresa Baldus of the free press last week showed the kind of grace that his, his co-defendant has never mustered when he basically said, I got no complaints about judge Edmund. She let me out early. She gave me back some of my life. I got to be grateful for that. I mean, that's, that seems to me to be an appropriate response as to no, I've changed. Give me money. I want to be able to travel freely, even though you let me travel freely. I admit to everything, even though I don't admit to anything. I mean, I didn't realize that this was this just popped up on Edmund's desk. I mean, that may be where Kilpatrick's luck is starting to change because who knows this case better than her yeah. in the federal courthouse? I just assume she got it because she handles all Kilpatrick-related matters. No, no, it, it did go to her because uh, it was originally her case. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. That's what I was wondering, how that okay. worked. 
Yeah, but you know, when I was uh, preparing for the trial in the Kilpatrick case, uh, I read his uh, autobiog- autobiography. It was called "Surrender: The Rise, the Fall, and the Redemption of uh, yeah. Kwame oh, yeah. Kilpatrick." And you know, in there, there was just a complete lack of introspection. Uh, you know, he he blamed everybody else for his problems. He called Kim Worthy dastardly. He had choice words for you and the media and oh. the business elites. And you know, it was everybody trying to stop him rather than really looking at himself and saying, what have I caused? What have I done to contribute to the problem here? Well, and he, he has a new book. He claims he has no income whatsoever, but he was just in town a couple of weeks ago for a book signing. So I assume he's not giving them away. There must be some, you know, some money coming in there uh, on YouTube. CJ. So intelligent says, why would the sec be after Kwame? And, uh, Mark, you, you may know, but my, my recollection is there was a pension case where he was giving away millions of dollars of retirees' money, and there were some fines as part of the, the resolution there that, that haven't been paid. Right. Yeah. No, as the mayor of Detroit, he was an ex officio member, trustee of the, both, uh, both retirements, uh, police and fire and the general retirement system, and uh, that was a complete pay-to-play system there. And uh, SEC got wind of that, and they uh, brought a case against him. I believe it was a default judgment that they ultimately uh, was awarded. But yeah, he he owes them money. He owes the IRS money. He owes the city of Detroit. So uh, all of that uh, is going to be very difficult to collect on the minute that this supervised release term is over in a year. I mean, you were able to track down a lot of money, not just from transfers, but cash. I mean, you guys found cash. Do you suspect he still has money hidden somewhere or did you think you found all of it and marked it all and know where it's at? We, we always thought that there probably was money out there, but the fact that he has made some of his filings pro se and that, uh, you know, he uh, ultimately didn't get the uh, attorneys. He, he wasn't paying a, um, oh, okay. uh, attorneys all the time. And that made me think if he's fighting for his liberty and he's not getting the attorney of his choice, at least according to him, that maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, the cash has gone dry. Um, I don't know. Or maybe he's got it squirreled away somewhere that he'll collect later when no one's looking. Well, right. Why, why not end the, uh, the supervised release? Because if you have to tell somebody, well, I need to go to the Caymans, somebody might say, well, I think we're going to follow you to the Caymans and you go into some bank, uh, with an empty bag and you come out with a bursting bag like the vacuum cleaner bag that they smuggled money in way back when nail on clift yeah i mean you know i I, to me when he says he doesn't want to be watching where he's going it makes me wonder if he's trying to beat a path to the money because he needs the dough yeah you know that's actually a thought i hadn't had was uh with supervised release he has to have a legitimate reason for his travel and they're not going to let him go to the bahamas or the cayman islands or somewhere else that you might have some uh lax banking Uh, could he theoretically send someone though I mean, or would the or would the feds track that? No, he, that, that's that's true. I mean, that's what happened with Malon Clift, um, Bobby Ferguson, toward the end of the uh, Kilpatrick administration, when everything was falling to pieces. Um, basically, gave ninety thousand dollars in cash to Malon Clift, a buddy of his from I think it was college, and stood up in his wedding and just said, "Hey, look, uh, you got to get this to Kwame," and uh, he put it in his. Uh, I think it was in his vacuum cleaner for right. safekeeping and then uh, gave it to him in two tranches. But uh, yeah, that, that would be the way to do it. And, you know, frankly, in supervised release, it's not the same uh, level of supervision. They, you're just basically checking in with your probation officer once a month and uh, make sure that you're, you know, uh, you're, you're not taking drugs or, you know, uh, committing bank robberies and things like that. Wait, you're saying that is or is not? Like, what is his supervision like right now? It's it's fairly uh, lenient. Um, oh, really? Yeah, it's just basically a, a check in. There's there's not a drone hovering over his his house right now. Just like there weren't black helicopters and news helicopters hovering over the Manugian mansion or following his family everywhere. It went like he claimed. I mean, but he has to get approval for travel, like we were talking right, about right, and certain things. Yeah. Now, one of the things that that has uh, has puzzled me is. In the end, the restitution that he was supposed to pay as, as part of the RICO case was somewhere in the millions of dollars. And now he only owes in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. But the court has said he's only made $5,000 in payments. How do we go from millions to hundreds of thousands? Where did that where did those that couple million come from? During the appellate process, he challenged uh, some of the uh, restitution award. And the uh, government, we 
conceded at the time that he was right as to uh, the kind of causal nexus between his actions and some of the losses. They're, they're very difficult to show um, how the losses really transpire. There's no formula, right? You have right. to kind of build a case for yeah. that too. And then uh, he and Bobby Ferguson were found jointly and severally liable for the restitution. And because a lot of money had been seized from Bobby, Bobby Ferguson, Ferguson, a lot of that then was used to pay and satisfy the the money judgment, and uh, um, Kwame Kilpatrick benefited from that. So once, so, again, once so, again, someone else paid for him. Yes, even the money he says he's paid, he has not paid. It was taken by force, and it wasn't even his money. Right? No, there was no voluntary surrender of money in this case, and certainly not by Kwame Kilpatrick. How much is he supposed to be paying per month right now? You know, I don't know what it is. It's pretty minimal, like a hundred dollars yeah. a month or yeah. so. So he's gonna have a still Miller's a tab and, owing. And, and Bobby Ferguson's were that low. I would assume his would have been that low. Right. So to act like you can't pay that, it's first off, it's ludicrous that it's that low. Why is that? Why is it only a hundred dollars? You, you know, know th that's a good question. I I haven't followed exactly why it was made that way. I mean, in some cases with. Um, with uh, defendants that don't have the financial resources or means, the concern is, hey, we want to get these people back out there and productive members of society if they've got this big weight on their shoulders. Yeah, don't, don't start them stealing banks it's again ridiculous. so they can make their restitution payment on the, on the bank robbery. Oh, yeah, because that's, that's why they'd rob a bank, yeah. Well, to yeah. pay restitution. I, I can guarantee well, do what you they a, do. a year from now, you are not going to be seeing more restitution payments by uh, Kwame Kilpatrick. And, um, the government can still try to go after that, get money judgments against him, but it doesn't seem like money judgments make the it IRS, much of a difference. Can the IRS take, take money from him? Yeah, they can garnish um, you know, his wages if he has legitimate wages. Uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly how he declares his income right now. Well, this is this is one of the cash. things that that I'd love to know. I I, I mean, I imagine he's not uh, making a fortune with these book signings. I'd be surprised if he made enough money selling books to cover his travel expenses. But he says he's he's a preacher, and I I wonder who ordained him. I haven't seen anything about that, but it reminds he me. Did. Yeah, well, he ordained himself. There was a laying out of hands, I guess. But <laughs> he's it, the chosen one. Remember? It reminds me of when he was a teacher. And this was after he came back to um, came back to Detroit from Florida A and M, where he claimed he had a teaching certificate, and he didn't. And I reported that, and that's one of the reasons why his folks went after me at Channel Four. But more on that another time. There was a there was a provision at the time that when the school district was short of teachers, a substitute teacher could teach as a full time teacher as long as they were working on their certification. So he got a job teaching, and by all accounts, was a very good teacher, very good mentor, very good leader of young people. Um, next year, they needed teachers. He was still a substitute teacher, became a full-time teacher again. Same deal, supposed to be working on his certification. Never sends them what he's working on, never shows them he's making progress towards his certification. So the third year, Detroit Public Schools says, you know, we can't let you teach anymore because you were supposed to be working on your certification. You haven't shown us that. You're not certified, and this program only allows you to do this for two years before we have to put the brakes on. And Kilpatrick sent a letter to these, uh, these officials who were trying to make him follow their rule, their law, and said, my mother talked to the superintendent, and he said it would be okay, so, uh, so I'd like to keep teaching. And I think then they said, no, I don't, I don't think so. And I, I wonder if that's the same thing that's happening here with his ordination that, you know, I'm, I'm planning to be ordained, but in the meantime, I'm, I'm a preacher. I'm, you know, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm speaking the word and you can see him on Instagram talking about Bible study and all these things, but it, it just seems like if there's no one holding that ruler up, holding that yardstick up, requiring him to prove the truth of what he says, he just hopes people will believe it. And some do. Yeah, I don't know how many people are following his or part of his flock. Um, that'd be interesting to know. Yeah, and I, I think he does <laughs> preach at different really churches. Be. I'd love to talk to those but, people. Yeah, it seems to be an online ministry. I don't know. It's uh, he's no Benny Hinn. I'll say that for him. Right? Does anybody remember Benny Hinn? No, it must be something from with the, the with the, the amazing hair. Home over the big TV. Yeah, I mean, there, what there's a Sean. Hi, Sean. Fantastic, fantastic quaff. Well, we got into your field of comb over, so so. Yeah. Well, I don't have enough to comb over. <laughs> but um No, 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 sorry, sorry. I checked out. Uh, what? Hey, what? That's rude. 5 years ago, Patrick. That's rude. 4 years. Sorry. 
Well, you, you know, the, the good people of Fox 2 thought it was a big enough story to, to put me back on Did the air. Did you wear your Spartan jersey when you went on the air? Uh, no, I wore my... No, he had two pullover uh, sweatshirts, which I wore was my Detroit looking. Free Press fleece because I wanted to represent... O- over another fleece yeah, nice. that zipped up. Do you have a suit, by the way, for six months straight? I have a fair number of suits, but I don't have enough for... Si- but, you know, the best suit story, actually, one of my favorite stories from the whole damn trial was this guy who has so many suits he can change up every day had even more suits, but he left some of them behind in Dubai. Remember when you put a guy in the witness stand, John Rutherford, what what did he testify to? Yeah, John Rutherford was a... uh, Not the guy from the Kaju Cafe. (laughs) We called him the homeless shelter tycoon. He had made a ton of money through the uh, Wayne County Detroit Mental Health uh, Authority um, with uh, basically franchising... uh, um, homeless shelters and and he wanted to take that and parlay that into uh casinos and uh down by the riverfront yeah lots of other uh bennies and so he as i recall um kwame kilpatrick was going to dubai needed some cash so that he could get some uh suits he'd heard that uh, they have really great cloth there um so i got ten thousand dollars from uh rutherford to go and uh then he had uh brought it back the swatches of uh of uh, this specialized uh, cloth to uh, this guy named, uh, I'm trying to remember his name now, uh, Alabioso um, was his tailor. And he put that suits together for him. Uh, so there was actually some material, I think, that came back. He left some of it there as well. And uh, ultimately, there was an, another guy that uh, I think got the job constructing the Heilman Rec Center. He had to pay for the tailoring on that in order to get the rec center project. What? Yeah, and as I recall, uh, I think Rutherford gave them $10,000 on the tarmac as they're getting ready to fly to Dubai. Kilpatrick is in Dubai, and there was Wait, a... So he flew private, of course. How stupid of me for not thinking that. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure about that. Well, but it's on the tarmac. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, Mark may recall those details. Yeah, I don't remember the details on that. He's but, so relatable to his constituents. Yeah, exactly. See a lot of people in Detroit. He's one of us. But um, but when he gets to Dubai, there's there's a big meeting. And, you know, there's a, there's a big thing where uh, getting together for a big event is, a, is, is, is sort of how you close the deal. Kilpatrick missed this event. The whole reason why local business people want him to go to Dubai, because he was getting fitted for the suits, and then when they leave Dubai, my recollection was they left the suits behind, but maybe they left some and brought some back. But yeah, I'll have to dredge that back up again. But yeah, but no, so you're there, right, there could the, have been more suits. Right. You know, the delegation was uh, was waiting for him, and he and he never showed yeah, the whole he, purpose of his going to Dubai. Oh. And, and that reminds me of another story I heard from the mayor of Windsor that after the Super Bowl, you know, that Kilpatrick went down to the Super Bowl with a big contingent to see how they did it in New Orleans so they could prepare for when the Super Bowl <laughs> okay. comes to Detroit. And... Um, there's a there's a, a ceremony where the mayor of the city that just hosted hands off a, a football, a ceremonial football, to the mayor of the city that's going to host. And Roger Penske and all these guys in the host committee are waiting there for Kilpatrick to show up. Now, of course, he spent tons of money, brought Christine Beatty and all these people down there. And... Um, and they're waiting for the handoff of the ceremonial football. And because they're... They're billing Detroit Super Bowl as the International Super Bowl. Windsor and Detroit are the, the joint hosts. Kilpatrick never shows up. Eddie Francis, the mayor of Windsor, is standing there. And after a while, Penske or somebody gets sick of waiting for Kilpatrick and says, you're a mayor, take the football. So they give the football to the mayor of Windsor and they all get the hell out of there because they got sick of waiting for Kilpatrick, who, of course, wow. never showed up because the party was over. And if the party's over, why the hell would you stay around to do your job? Yeah, I you know talking about delegations, I remember the large retinues that he would bring to like the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, there was one in Dallas once, and uh, the uh, they basically everyone's heads were turning because they thought he was a foreign head of state when he arrived in <laughs> Dallas. And the uh, the mayor of Chicago at the time, uh, Richard Daly, was there by himself wandering around, and then he just saw this phalanx of. Uh, People from Detroit with uh, wearing earpieces and all that kind of stuff, and they're like, "Oh my God, uh, is there some somebody from another country here?" But no, it was Detroit. Yeah, and of course, Duggan, whatever you think of him, drives himself, walks around without bodyguards, which I always, I always felt like if you were, if you were trying to send a message to the world that Detroit is safe, 
and you're a big guy, why do you need a bunch of cops walking around you? I mean, that's just, if you don't feel safe, then why the hell should I feel safe over on the east side? I mean. You now, like to feel important. Yeah. Well, it, really a lot of it, it a lot of it was about the show. Status, yeah. yeah. Now, now, Mark, you said you looked at all the text messages? I looked at all the text messages between uh, Kwame Kilpatrick and Bobby Ferguson. I, I will say this, that uh, we had a paralegal in the office. I, I didn't really want to look at any of the romance type things, and so... I asked her to take a look at it, and uh, uh, she looked stricken at the end of the day after, uh, you know, looking through those things. And, eyes glaze. Yeah, yeah. I just basically wanted to look at the financial transactions. I had no interest in anything else. Well, the reason why I ask you is because this never dies, that there was a party at the Manoogian Mansion. Did you or anybody you worked with ever see anything in the text messages that indicated there was a party at the Manoogian Mansion that a stripper was there, that a stripper was harmed, anything to suggest that? You know, I didn't see anything that uh, proved that. And your familiarity with the text messages and with the people involved, is it possible, is it conceivable, even in Bizarro World, that they would have a crazy-ass party where some stripper got her ass beat and maybe killed and not mention one syllable about it in text messages? I mean, it's possible, although uh, I got to say that they mentioned a lot of other things in those text messages. So it didn't look like that they were uh, being reticent to use that thing to kind of open up with uh, their deepest secrets. Um, you know, at one point, um, I, I remember uh, Kilpatrick said, uh, I think it was at the beginning of his administration, um, that uh, Mayor Coleman Young had been followed by the feds. Uh, you know, they'd wiretapped his phones and you know, but he didn't have to worry about that because he uh, was using text pagers. And, and we're thinking, well, so that, that kind of suggests that he didn't realize that there was a technology to actually collect that stuff. Yeah. So all of which is to say, and I'm no apologist for Kwame Kilpatrick. I think that's probably abundantly clear by now. But if you're going to come up to me and tell me that the Manoogian Mansion party really happened, please, please just bring one scintilla of evidence because of all the stuff this guy did that he denies, this is the one thing he denies doing that he didn't do. So please, can we put the Manoogian Mansion Party rumor to rest? Go, going back to uh, the case, and he's, he's being charged with Bobby Ferguson and Bernard Kilpatrick. Why, what was Bernard found guilty of? He was found guilty of tax crimes. Uh, the jury hung, and, and I don't know what the vote count was, but they hung on the RICO charge against him, against Bernard Kilpatrick. So he ended up, uh, I think, serving 15 months for tax crimes. And how much money did he end up bringing in? Because he took bribes, correct? Yeah, he, he was getting a or lot of money bags. from uh, from Rutherford, Cases from of uh, champagne. Carl Cato. Yeah, I mean, he was one of those indispensable members of anyone who had to do business in the city. Were you satisfied with um, with um, how he was found and what he served? Well, I, I definitely thought he was part of the conspiracy. Yeah. Um, you know, the... The way he I mean, conducted himself at yeah. the way he conducted himself at the trial, he sort of sat apart from uh, Kilpatrick and Ferguson, who were just kind of yucking it up the whole time. Um, you well, know, so he together. Took it seriously? Yeah, I think they thought they were going to get acquitted. Uh, they were shocked. I, mean, I don't know if you were there, ML, when the yeah. verdict was read, but their jaws just dropped. I think that they figured that this was just a. Six month, uh, the six months that they'd have to endure, and then they'd walk. This is what I'm flummoxed about with Kwame Kilpatrick. I think he's a really smart guy, but he is just not self aware at all, and it kind of goes back to him not accepting responsibility for what he did. I find it amazing that you could sit through that trial and be shocked that you're found guilty of so many counts. That that's a that's amazing to me. I don't know. It, to me, when I think of Kwame Kilpatrick, I think of the guy who wears a speedo to the beach. Everybody else knows you look like shit, and you're sitting there saying, "If I had a little more oil, I could shine." But he's, a little but more he's not lady. dumb. I mean, I, you wouldn't characterize him as dumb, would you? You he's know what? I would, he's just a crook. What I would say about Kwame Kilpatrick, and I guarantee, if he was sitting with us right now, everybody would love him and hate us he's because very he's just yeah. he's just he's just got that magnetism. But we're not as dumb as. He thinks we are. He's very well, smart. We're just with. not as dumb as he thinks we are. Or maybe he knows the deal. He's like, I only need 51% of these idiots. So the rest of you, whatever. Um, Mark, I, I want to ask you before we let you go, and thanks for coming. It's great to have you on the show. We've had uh, Mike Bellotta, who also put in some yeoman's work on this conviction on the show before. So it's a real treat to have you on here too. Um, was Kilpatrick offered a plea deal? 
And if so, can you tell us what it was? It, well, I, I don't know that I'm at liberty to say that. So. Well, let, me, let me put it the other way. And correct me if I'm wrong. It's my understanding that everyone who is facing federal charges has to be offered some sort of resolution short of a trial. Is that right? Well, that's standard practice. It's not a requirement. Um, I, I would suggest that you talk to uh, Jim Thomas or, or Kwame Kilpatrick, for that matter, and maybe they can answer that question for you. Well, Kilpatrick doesn't do any free appearances, so that's out. You're such a lawyer. But, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. That, that one, I, I think, uh, I'll leave that for the defense lawyer to answer that question. Fair. Okay. Uh, I will just tell you, my sense is that he was offered a deal, and he turned it down because he thought he was going to beat the, beat the rap. And I'll tell you, I think it was one of the very first counts that came back with a guilty plea. And I've often wondered, what would it be like to think they're going to read my name 30 times and say not guilty and then hear guilty and then say there might be 29 more of these <laughs> i don't know must not have been a good day for him so, though that's why you don't commit those crimes that's why you wear the dark suit to court <laughs> because no one can tell what happened below the waistband when you heard that one's 20 years oh. <sighs> yeah that's bad that's bad so uh so, Mark, thanks for coming in. Um, I know you're working in private practice now, so uh, hopefully hopefully you'll still find a way to serve the public uh, through that work. But uh, you've been un- involved in a lot of great cases, um, brought a lot of justice to this jurisdiction. There's a lot more to come. I know you're involved with Macomb County Public Corruption Investigation oh. that's wrapping up and some other stuff. So, uh, so thanks. And, and you've left you've left the uh, the office in some, some good hands. I think David Gardy there is probably has a higher sense of moral outrage than, than I do, which means he's not going to let anybody slide, which is, is good he's to a, know. He's a tough cookie. Yeah, he's... Uh, I, I will just say that I follow the law because I'm afraid of, of guys like you guys. <laughs> What's, what, what, and I'm too pretty. Not, if I got inside, it wouldn't last long. I, I know you kind of wrapped it up, but I do want to ask one more question. What's next for him? I mean, when can he file this again to ask to be released? Because you said within a year you expect him... I think he's a, he's done. I don't think he's going to appeal this. Um, well, he might. I, I suppose. You never know. He seems him, to. Yeah. He seems to push things. Um, when but, are we going to hear from him again? Besides, I mean, legally, not just asking. For I, mean, I, I would guess he's going to keep quiet until he gets uh, to that third year of uh, supervised release where it ends, and uh, and then who knows? Maybe he'll be in the Cayman Islands. Ugh. Of course he will. Yeah, dig, <laughs> digging up some money, some cash left there. Yeah, Ab- I, apparently, well, maybe allegedly. So my theory is, is Bobby, who I always thought was a lot shrewder than Kilpatrick. If there's any money hidden, Bobby knows where it is, and he's way too smart to tell Kilpatrick. He is way too smart. Plus, Bobby's got all that earth moving equipment. He could dig that shit deep and bury it way down. Below. But he's supervised too, so yeah, well, for a year. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's so. wait. So oh, uh, stay yeah. tuned. You know, before we let you go, l- l- let me Bobby just. Bobby t- was part of it, yeah. Let me touch on that point real quick because there's been a lot of talk about whether the sentence for Kilpatrick was was extravagant. The three years of supervised release, that's fairly standard, right? So yeah, that's, that's typical for any uh, federal felony. Okay, so whatever you think of the 28 years, the three year rip for supervision, that's just that's de rigueur. Yeah, and just. Keep in mind that Jimmy DeMora is still serving his 28-year sentence down in uh, you know, the former Cuyahoga County uh, supervisor. Yeah, who uh, was the first guy to get 28-year sentence for public corruption, uh, did a hell of a lot less than Kilpatrick did. For folks who want to make this racial, Jimmy DeMora, white guy, also much older than Kilpatrick, so a 28-year year sentence is going to hit him a hell of a lot harder He's also been trying to get released and seems to have some health problems as well that would arguably justify an early release. And Jimmy is still making license plates. So uh, you want to talk about unfairness. We can talk about that all day, but don't leave Jimmy DeMora out of the equation because if anybody's got a reason to bitch, it's old Jimmy D. And I'm happy to let him rot too, by the way. So that's I'm not suggesting he be turned loose. Jimmy but, uh, D. <laughs> well, that's what he told me to call him. You know, it's, All right. It's, it's Jimmy D. Um, Mark, thanks very much. Yeah, and, great to be uh, here. And we look forward to having you back on again. Maybe for the... Uh, can you wait till the 20th anniversary, Sean, sure. or you want to get him back? <laughs> oh, whatever he wants to come back. Still okay. With Sean. All right. You got I, an open invitation and uh, and Sean's, Sean's blessing, so that's you don't do any better than that on this show. Sounds good. 
Okay. See you then. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for coming. If, uh, if you do have a pile of money and you have a big financial decision coming up, uh, maybe you're purchasing a new home, a new car, or something cosmetic, you got to know how that decision is going to affect your current and future financial goals. That's why we recommend Luke Nowacki and his team at Pinnacle Wealth Strategies. They can help you plan for all your financial goals, both today and well into the future. Give Luke a call. He's a good man. 248 663 4748 for a complimentary consultation to see if your plans do align with your goals. And there's one thing that Luke, about Luke, that never changes that when you call him, he'll make it all about you, sweetheart. Securities and investment advisory services offered through Royal Alliance Associates Inc., member FINRA SIPC. Royal Alliance Associates Inc. is separately owned, and other entities and or marketing names, products, or services referenced here are independent of Royal Alliance Associates Inc. So Luke will set you up for the future today. But if you need some cash right away, David Hall's the man to call. Exactly. Yeah. Say you have uh, a lot of debt and you don't want to keep paying those high rates because mortgage interest rates, on the other hand, they're the lowest they've been in about four or five months. Um, and now the holidays are behind us. You have these bills coming in. It's time to consider consolidating your debt with a cash out refinance. You can use the equity that you have in your home to put yourself in a better financial situation. It's the most affordable way to eliminate debt. And right now, you can get a free five minute mortgage review with Hall Financial. That's all it's going to take to see how much money you've gained in your home equity. And in most cases, you can actually access that money, like ML said, pretty quick, two weeks or less. Whether you're looking to purchase a new home or refinance your current home or get this money out of your home, you need to call Hall Financial first, 866-CALL-HALL, or feel free to chat with them online at callhallfirst.com. And if you need to contact Luke or David Hall, you can use the link on our website, which is mlsolvedetroit.com. And when you let them know that you want to do business with them, let them know where you found out about them because it, it helps them continue to support us, which helps us come back to you every week and bring great guests like Mark Chutko. And, you know, Mark used to listen to the Drew and Mike show on WRAF. And, uh, you know, believe it or not, these guys listen to what's in the media and sometimes they get ideas about how to, uh, you know, what to look for because the audience and the hosts sometimes, you know, there's some common sense there that uh, that can help bring uh, these You're miscreants to justice. You're such a sweetheart. And I make it all about you, <laughs> sweet, sweetheart. Uh, don't sell yourself short. You've done a lot so, of good work on us, too. So. But, but the other way to support our show is to please subscribe to our YouTube channel, ML Soul of Detroit. Uh, we appreciate it. And you can always find out. If you hit the bell, you'll get an alert, so you'll always know when we're going to go live. And uh, we have some great guests coming up later this month. I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver that tends to be what the billionaires do, as mm -hmm. we discussed last week on the show about the billionaires who are looking for millions, hundreds of millions in tax breaks from all of us so that they can maybe do the projects that they say they're going to do. Yeah. So wow. we'll continue to stay on that. J.C. Rindell was on last week's show. If you missed it, please check it out. By the way, he had, a, he had out. a really good follow-up uh, article today because he attended the public hearing. Last yeah. night, yeah. Yes. And, yeah. So those are weekly, and somebody asked last week in our comments if I was going to go to the hearing uh, or the, the public forum, whatever it was, last Tuesday, and I did. And uh, it's very interesting. You know, the I, I had a chance to talk to some of the people from Olympia Entertainment and from the related companies, which is Stephen Ross's mm -hmm. group. And they're like, yeah, no, we, we keep our promises, and if, if we don't, if we don't, do what we're supposed to do. We don't get the benefits. So let us do it because if we come up short, you don't have to pay us, which is an interesting argument, except what ends up happening is if you sign up for the tax credits and you have access to the property and you don't do anything with it, we can't give those credits to anybody else and nobody else can come in and do that project. So I don't think the hey, if we screw up, don't worry about it's it. So rigged. <laughs> that that ain't gonna feed the bulldog on this one. You're gonna have to come a little more correct on that. JC's been going to those hearings every Tuesday. There's gonna be some votes coming up soon, and this will get to city council in March. So we're gonna have more to say about this on this show. You're gonna read more about this in the Detroit Free Press. And we look forward to hearing your thoughts, and we know you have opinions on this, so do not be shy. And Sean will have more to say after this. Oh, man, the geeks have inherited the earth. Yeah, I do that. What a dork. Is <laughs> him wanting to play with us again mean that he's turning into a geek, or we're turning into cool guys? So I try not to speak ill of the dead, and not just because I'm afraid they'll haunt me, but Carlotta Liebenstein... <sighs> A lot of Liebenstein, okay. And maybe Liebenstein was a German countess 
who made her transition in 1992. But when she left, she left $400 million. Oh, have you seen? Okay, go ahead. To Get Gunter <laughs> the Third. Well, Gunter is no longer around. We're now up to Gunter the Sixth, still living off Liebenstein uh, loot. And now this whole thing has made itself into a documentary. And I'm going to guess that you have not seen it yet. I will tell you, I have not seen it. I've seen but all of it. and I, I do want to see it because it seems amazing. Uh, there are, I uh, see, I can't say anything because I don't want to ruin it, but there are two big twists in this. Well, so let me tell you what I've read about this. Yeah. Um, that somehow. And the name of the show is uh, Gunther's Millions. Gunther's Tom Millions, Netflix. It's yeah. a four part doc. And the money is basically turned into really an employment program for a bunch of hustlers, but there's a porn angle in it too. Is that right? Uh, yeah, there's a sex. Uh, there's always, come on, you got a lot of money, and there's always going to be a sex angle. But it's we not, just talked about Kilpatrick. It's of course, not, there's going to be a sex angle when it comes to money. Gunter's not in the porn, is he? Uh, well, I wouldn't. Oh boy, I don't want to ruin it. But okay, I, I, okay. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't care, believe it or not, I wouldn't categorize it as porn. Is that just because what Brandon has shown you is no? It's changed it's, your whole uh, sex gets involved, but it's not not. It's like, God, it's really hard to talk. I don't want to ruin it because it's a really ridiculously fun ser- documentary series to watch. It is, it's so weird. Is there a doggy style angle here set where we're going or no? Well, no, the dog is not involved in the sex. Okay. okay. Well, that's a, that also describes another form of coitus. It's not, it doesn't actually involve I, I, a dog. I want you to watch it though this week so we can revisit. Okay. What you just said about the Countess. Okay. Gunter's Millions. Uh, we, we'll have a full report next week. But for leaving $400 million to a dog, uh, Countess Carlotta Liebenstein, you are uh, ex post facto our Geek of the Week. <laughs> So it's been great to hear from all the shoegazing fans out there. Who knew? So many people knew how to gaze a shoe. It's crazy. And we want to, or as Christopher Walker would say, it's crazy. Uh, We want to play more of your favorite shoegazing tunes in room 7609 but we're gonna have to wait till march because it's black history month and so we want to highlight some of the new wave bands that have been led by black performers or that consist entirely of black performers that second category we're really searching on so if you can help us please send us something in the meantime here's the fine young cannibals with a song that could have been written by kwame kilpatrick i'm not the man i used to be
Young Cannibals uh, with uh, playing a hit from yesterday with uh, Not the Man I Used to Be here on. Uh, I, I think it picked up you saying something about your age and John yawning. Yeah, that's that's what happens behind the scenes. If you were one of our <laughs> Patreon supporters, you could see all of that for a mere one hundred dollars a month. We we're having quite the depressing conversation, which I guess pretty, fit the music. Pretty well, exciting show. Th- the yeah. fine young you cannibals. Shut up. The fine young cannibals are sort of a. Uh, well, I don't mean the show is great. I'm, I said I'm no. I said no. Saying when we're not recording, it's pretty exciting. I said no ragging on the that. show until we're an hour I'm in. I'm saying the show is great, but when we're not recording, well, I guess we're recording, but we're taking a break, like we're playing a song. The behind the scenes banter. Well, bring that's that energy was, now. That's what I was being facetious about. That that's exciting. When bring it's that energy really now. High. I think it's pronounced fastidious, but uh, but thank you. No, I'm a little sore, you know, a little, uh, l- little out of it, a little sore today. Is it Gunter the Fourth? <laughs> Get you with that dog? No, 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 no. My car. Oh. Um, oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My car got stuck. I didn't realize this at first. You know, sometimes on pavement you get a little impression, a little, you know, kind of a not a quite a pothole, but so your tires go down into this impression. Well, there was ice on it this morning, and um, I couldn't get out of it. I tried to rock it, rock it, so I finally got out of the car. Or is this at, is this at your house? No, I, it was. Uh, I was under a carport, and it was also melting, so it was dripping on my back. Because I was trying to push this and rock the car out of this little impression, this indentation. Oh, please, please let there be some surveillance camera or a and, ring camera uh, that's happening. And I, I got it rocking a little bit, and I could barely, you know, just about get it up over the the little incline there to get it out on the level, and I uh, couldn't quite do it. So finally, I figured out I could pull. And uh, it was a little bit more effective. I opened the window and then used the the door jam to pull. And I finally got it out. But I'm I'm not thirty. Anymore. Were you by yourself? I did, or? and I got it out. Which so what if you got this thing rolling? And, and then uh, I was hurt. No, I not. I as soon as I got it rolling, I stopped it. I mean, I pulled the other way to stop it. But uh, I paid for it on the drive over. Yeah, I was in, I was not feeling. Oh my God, it was uh, yeah. So you know how it is in your mind. You think, oh well, I. Oh used, God, yeah. I used to be able to do this kind of thing all the oh, time. Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't yeah. even think about it. I'm like, you know, I'm not that far from 60. So you just, yeah, yeah fuck. Well, you, you're like, so a, a guy I grew up with, Bill Tekos, amazing goalie, was on track to be in the Olympics. I think he was going to school in the UP playing hockey at Tech or, or Northern or something like that. Same as a bunch of guys, car can't get moving. They put a board under the back wheel. Oh, no. Back then, everything was rear-wheel drive. Board shoots out, hits him in the knee, hockey career kaput. Oh. So it could have been worse. No, I was kind of looking around, and I was on the ground I was on. was There was no ice on that. It was just in the impression. And I was. I was looking around thinking, okay, you know, what's gonna, what's the, what's the worst that can happen here? To the car, to me, in that way. I wasn't worried about getting seriously hurt, but I, I just didn't consider – the strain of muscles you don't use yeah. when you're trying to move move something. Yeah, you like normally that. don't do that motion. So I yeah, just thought exactly. of another parallel. Your Olympic dream is over now too. <laughs> well, you're no, never going to make it. This is it's my over. This yeah. is my no Olympic dream. Yeah. Yeah. It's the podcast Olympics. The, the, it's my Olympic dream. Pentathlon over. So yeah. So the decathlon the, the, was the, gone a long time ago. The melting off the carport did it. It soaked up my back, which is fine. Whatever. So I've been kind of cold, wet, and sore this whole show. So sorry about that. <laughs> wow, this is some. <laughs> Hey, Mark, um, I know I shouldn't laugh you, at it, but did, why is it? It's but, so you funny to me. but you didn't need me. You know? It's Mark. You didn't need we me. Always need you, Sean. No, what you, are you, you talking killed, about? You had killed Patrick, you know. So maybe I was sort of defeated. I wanted you. The, I wanted you to defend him when I saw the. Um, 
So that reminds me of another the pre-show uh, kind of lineup. I was fine young cannibal song. Why can't I drive? The That's ice is so cold. That's not bad. My car won't roll. <laughs> My bones are saw. Oh, you were just talking about book signings earlier. I was at a book signing last Whoa. night. Whoa, really? Congratulations. Can we have a non sequitur bell? I didn't know you put a book together. No, I didn't. Can, oh. can we have a non sequitur gong? Yes. <laughs> no, a da- a, like an anvil dropping on yes. listeners' no, heads. The, the Cornelius Johnson, the, uh, the uh, receiver. Your Corny J. The receiver for Michigan. His dad turns out as a historian and wrote this book about this whole area of a whole era of basketball from like 1904 to 1930. Ooh. Barnstormers. Okay. Yeah, it was kind of cool. Anyway. I, I, now, I think you guys were talking about this on the Drew and Mike show, uh, Mark, but one of my favorite books, and is also a good movie, was the Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars and Motor Kings about the barnstorming baseball teams. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was a good documentary on that, too. Great, great book. Very good movie, too. James Earl Jones, Billy D. Williams... I think Richard Pryor's in it too. Yeah, but the, so so the question I have for y'all is what? Why is we know so much more about the Negro Leagues and baseball? Is it just because we romanticize baseball more and we associate it with longevity? Because we know nothing about the, there was very similar stuff with basketball. Yeah, because um, but baseball is America's game. Yeah, that's why. Uh, that's why you know? it was the number one sport. Mm-hmm. It yeah. was no yeah. for sure. I mean, and so that was everybody followed it. But uh, that reminds me. Speaking of <laughs> of Black History Month. Which I was trying to till Sean told me about his his sore back. Um, there's a guy I met, which led to the uh, to the book signing and the the, the, the black hair. Uh, now I'm getting, is, that, is that the non sequitur? It is now. I just invoked my own gong. Um, I met uh, a guy. I said bong. Sorry. I met a guy when I was running for Detroit City Council. Mark likes bongs. Who lives in Jefferson Chalmers? Who wrote a book about Ralph Bunch? who is, I believe, the first black Nobel Prize winner, and he's from Detroit. Oh, that's cool. So yeah. let's not forget about Dr. Bunch. <laughs> I did want to ask Mark, because I like to do this now. Oh, no. Yeah, he goes what? again. I want to know uh, what, you know, because you're the you're the man of culture, the man of pop culture. He's got especially. all the culture. What, what are we watching these days? What What are your recommendations? He's just like what some yogurt. Stay from? Stay away from. Oh boy, I have what been you watching? Cottage grudgingly cheese. watching um, The Last of Us. I thought you didn't like it. You said you didn't care about the but, character. But I think it's going to get. Well, see, I thought episode four got a little bit more into that. Well, everybody went uh, crazy over episode three. I've not oh, seen any of it. Fucking drove me up a wall. Nobody told me this was science fiction. I would have watched if I know it was science fiction. I thought it was one of these where somebody it's in the a, Walking in a, Dead. It's somebody the in a dead. friend group commits suicide, like that movie, that show on ABC. Uh, with uh, Ron Livingston kills himself, and they spend two years talking about how much they really liked Ron Livingston. Has anybody seen this? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Teresa's no. seen it, so I by Wait, what else? By Mark? osmosis, I've had to absorb some of this show. So yes or no on Last of Us? Oh, well, I'm going to stick with it. I'm just I'm very angry at it because it feels like, well, like it's The Walking Dead again with less characters. You sound angry like uh, angry it's, in the way when really you polish well, off a bag of Cheetos. Look, it's really well sort of self-loathing done. anger. Huh? No, I just I expect not talk about guilty pleasures. That's how I got knocked off Fox Two the first time. I expect more from it. Maybe that's my my standards are too high. I don't know. Oh, I know. You know what's you know what you would like, Mister, because you like basketball a lot and you're uh, very woke. Um, there's a documentary on Showtime about Mamou Abdul Raouf, uh, also known as Chris I saw Jackson. a trailer for that, and, and it's a regard i know people will roll their eyes because you know he turned his back on the national anthem that's what most people remember him for in an era that was yeah when no one did yeah no one did it and um he speaks in it but what was really interesting about it because i'm I'm a little younger than him but i remember when he was chris jackson mcdonald's high school all-american and how great he was i totally forgot though that he had tourette syndrome i mean that was a really interesting part of his story and then he leaves, re- you know, just abject poverty. He was just super poor. That's why he declared for the NBA after going home and going. By the way, by the way, since you brought this up, and we're this is our odds and ends portion of the show. What do you mean by woke? Um, because you, you hear it. Okay, yeah, no, it's you, become you, pejorative. I'm you sorry. hear it all the time. You're, no, no, uh, no, open minded. Let me say that. De- Can I say that you're open minded. Different, different people have different ideas of what that. Well, means. because I think when people hear that there is a documentary on Mahmoud Al Dourouf and think of him as the guy that sat right. in the national anthem 
um, they're immediately going to be angry about it. That I, it even exists. I wrote a, an interesting piece recently, and I don't want to get too far down this rabbit hole about the word woke and how it's been with within the black community for decades and decades and decades. And all it meant was be woke, aware. be aware, yeah, be, aware. be cautious, mm-hmm. be aware, understand what you're walking into. Yeah, yeah but and it's that tr- there's some f- yeah. frustration that it's been hijacked and turned I, into I, a. I didn't yeah. mean it as a pejorative term to you. No, it's okay. I'm it's saying okay it to if you your, did because I'm saying it to your face. It's okay right? if you did. <laughs> Um, but I think I think you would. Like I know it. I there's was, I know there's love there. I thought it was a really good documentary, and I didn't realize like um, Colin Kaepernick, who sat for the national anthem for a long time before people noticed. A few like two weeks, three weeks, maybe. Mahmoud Al Duarouf was doing it for like four months. The one thing I did here four I, months before anyone noticed. You know, Phil Jackson, who coached the the Bulls, right, and the Lakers, and the whole Zen master was dismissing Steph Curry uh, within this last year by saying, well, we've already had Steph Curry. It was, it was Chris Jackson. Steph Curry is featured heavily in the documentary. I wonder if he helped produce it or something. It's interesting though, because he, he just wanted to, you know, I don't know what it is with old timers in NBA. It's the one you and I've talked about this before. It's the one sport where nobody ever gets better. The eighties were the pinnacle and it's, or even maybe the early nineties with Jordan. And it's all been downhill ever since we don't do that in any other sport. Except for the NBA, and it's curious. I think because the NBA changes quicker than any other sport, I think that's a big part of it. You know, it's really it's really curious how we we don't believe in evolution. We don't think anybody's more skilled or faster. You know, with football, well, just, with football, that, it's so obvious that everybody's yeah. bigger and faster than yeah, <laughs> right. Well, on the but, rules, but basketball I mean, seems more boring to me. I I don't. Now that's a different argument. And that's yeah. a fair. That's a very fair assessment of the NBA. NBA, yes. That's a that's a and that's a fair argument. That's a different. But you know argument, why? Because everybody realized that wow, these big guys can shoot threes, and that's yeah. a much better efficiency shot if they who, can make them. Who knew Rashid Wallace was ahead of his time? Yeah, big guy steps out and hits yeah. a three instead I, of standing I, in the paint and trying to pick up the change. I have so many friends cover that, Rob Ory that bitch about the NBA, and I get it. I understand why you wouldn't like it. I, you know, I I'm not the, the, I'm not a diehard NBA. The guy. problem is it's so skilled that we we don't even know what we're looking at. It's it, or what we take it for granted. On any given night, you can see four or five plays that are just outrageous, but you don't think of it that way. You know, people hitting a step back turnaround, thirty five foot shot with a defender in his face. So many, George Mikan did that every night. So many guys can do it now. It's true. That's I mean, why, ev- yeah. there's so much skill that it's almost boring. And the Europeans, is, is that right? The Europeans have changed it because it's they, they were skill based and they were kicking our ass on the world stage, <laughs> and we were all about athle- they, had big, they had big guys that could shoot yeah. athleticism, yeah. right? Yeah. And now we have athletes with that kind of skill. It's crazy. How do we get here? Uh, well, I was just going to ask you, what was the best? This is what happens when you do Black History Month in room 7609. You kind of get off the rails real fast. Because um, there just aren't that many bands to talk about. But we are going to bring you, them forward. Do the voice. She drives me crazy. You do it. Sean drives me crazy. Oh, yeah. When he gets his car that. out of the ditch and he drives. Uh, what's the best uh, new name for a basketball player? I need player? a massage, best- by the way. Will you Will you help? I'm trying to send you a massage, which is move mean, on. Because I pulled some muscles. Oh, okay. Th- that presumes there's some muscles there. Um, th- what's a the little best, bit under the, under the fat. What's the best new name or, or chosen name for a basketball player ever? Uh, Steve uh, Hoyou Fat, the French player. Oh, that's not bad. Not, you, not, not the one I was him? thinking of. What are you talking about? Like a, 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 a nickname? Or is that what no, you mean? Somebody legally changed their name. Oh, I see. What oh, yeah, because I think I think Steve Hoyu Fat was his birth name. I mean, Kareem is pretty great, isn't it? Why? World, world be free. Oh, world be free. I was gonna say Meta World Peace. That's not bad either. That's pretty stupid. That's not bad either. But world be free is great. <laughs> yeah, world, like, world be free is great. Like ball Fat? too. <laughs> Does, do do people do that anymore? What? What's that? Change their names like that? When's the last time somebody did that? Well, I think I for religious it. reasons, yeah. yeah. Right, uh, but just for world be free or or well, meta, remember meta world peace. Marvin Hagler legally changed his name to Marvelous, Marvelous Marvin Hagler because uh, Howard Costell would not call him Marvelous Marvin Hagler because it wasn't his name. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Were you a Hagler fan? Uh, I was not really big into boxing. But, I liked Hagler. Loved him. Hagler was from Boston, and there was a story I heard. He would go up to a place. I think he owned a place in northern New Hampshire, which is... You know, when they say the White Mountains, it's not just because there's snow. No, it's it's a pretty homogeneous place. Yeah. 
And the New Hampshire state troopers who look a lot like Ranger Smith, one of them pulled him over. And I'm just wondering what it's like late at night to pull over Marvel and Marvis Hagler <laughs> and say, sir, I think you're going too fast. And he looks at you and you say, have a nice day. You just hand him back your license. You say, just, you know, get, you know, get, get, get there safely. I, I thought of another recent name change that's really good. Chad Ochocinco. Oh, yeah, that was good. That wasn't bad. He just gave a really fascinating interview. I think it was with Shannon Sharp. Um, that's another good documentary she watched, the new 30 for 30 on the Baltimore Ravens, but I digress. Um, he's giving an interview with Shannon um, Sharp, and he's making this point. He's like, I never bought I never bought watches. I didn't spend a lot, because he still has his money. Chad Ochocinco does. He goes, I didn't, he goes, I fly Spirit Air. He goes, why do I need a private jet? I can just fly Spirit. It saves me money. And he's like, I didn't buy watches. What do you need a fancy watch for? I would, but he would wear knockoffs, because you would see him with that jewelry on. And he's like, "Oh, what time is it right now?" Shannon. Shannon tells me, "See, I don't need a watch. I don't. Know, I find the, I find him to be very fascinating." You know, he was. Uh, I I got this is a different era of newspaper, but I got that sent down to Cincinnati to do a story on was it Anthony Tom? I don't know. They had a running back. It was a Michigan running back. Chris and Perry I was, was there for a while. It was Chris. It was Chris Perry. Oh. It was Chris Perry. And I was in Columbus because Federer was there, and they said, "Ah, oh, going down to Cincinnati, they were going to play the Lions or something." So I went in to interview Marvin. Um, was the head coach at the time, Marvin Jones? No, Marvin. Yeah, uh, Marvin Lewis. Marvin Lewis. Marvin yeah, Lewis. Marvin Lewis. Uh, to talk about Chris Perry. And, but anyway, I went into the locker room looking for Perry, and there was Chad Johnson just sitting there. And he saw me, and he said, "Hey, who are you looking for?" And he was just the. I mean, the and this was at the height of his run, and he was just the friendliest, nicest. Yeah. Yeah, guy. Sh- and that always stuck with me. He loves uh, gaming and playing games, and he will. He's challenged people, you know, over the internet. And if he finds out that they're close enough, he will drive to their house and play live with them, which is so bizarre. I well, love the guy. You know, I just remember he was super friendly, fun dude. Anyway, yeah. where were we? Find young cannibals, right? Yeah. So we would love. Yeah, to- great song. You never know what you're going to find in Room 7609. <laughs> uh, this week we're going to be featuring new wave bands. With uh, with prominent black members as part of our effort to uh, participate in Black History Month, so that was the Fine Young Cannibals. Um, we will have another surprise for you next month. If you have a nomination, please send it to ML Soul of Detroit at Gmail. I don't think you're going to get a lot of uh, emails on that. That's going to be hard, right? There's there's more than you'd think, but it's it's tough. It's tough. And I I I was doing some research this morning, and there's an article that suggests that Prince is the hmm. first black new wave artist, hmm. which is kind of interesting. I think you may be a little late to the new wave game, but he was so, so, so boundary breaking that, that well, I was just, you could make a case for that. Your boundaries of what's new wave are pretty, pretty yeah, vast. There are no boundaries. Yeah. That's it. That's right. I want to be your, yeah. I'm afraid. Of <laughs> oh, hey, Prince. Okay. Yeah, that's Prince. Come on, man. That no, I knew what it was. I didn't know where you were going with. Yeah, it. I don't know. You're asking for a back rub a minute ago. What the hell? <laughs> We're talking about a back rub. Horny German shepherds. It's <laughs> more of a more of a yeah shoulder massage. Yeah. That's when you know you stayed too long. Um, we also uh, gratefully accept all donations. No donation is too large. No donation is too small. And this week, there's no donation, so that was easy. It's. Uh, so easy to contribute. Mark can tell you how in just 30 seconds. MLSoloDetroit.com, donate button. That was less than 30 seconds. I That's thought awesome. You, thought you might drag it out a little bit. paying attention. Um, and, uh, and the other way you can support the show without spending a penny is subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's ML Soul of Detroit. And uh, hit the bell for an alert, and you'll always know when we are going live. Um, and uh, can we cue up our, uh, our, our feedback music, Ben? Yep. Yep. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. There we go. Ah. Buzz me mellow, right? Yes. Okay. I'm returning a text, Sean. No, you don't no, but to, you, I was curious if you me. did that from the laptop or from the board. So, uh, laptop. Brett Madcat Peel uh, gave us a five star rating. We invite you to rate the show on whatever platform you're listening to. We really do love to get your ratings, uh, even. If you hate us, rate us, because it all counts. Well, rate us five and then rip on us. That's true, too. Yeah. You can be ironic. Said, uh, or dichotic. Dichotic. What do you say? Whatever. Um, you, you'll catch on replay. Uh, <laughs> Brett writes, loved hearing Blur on the show. Would love to hear a month of Madchester artists, such as the Stone Roses and In Spiral Carpets. Only if it doesn't include the Smiths. Actually, would love to hear Mark's reaction on This Is How It Feels as it is a Manchester City chant. LOL, Ah. Brett. 
So I guess he's coming at you from a soccer the Chelsea yeah. uh, fan perspective. Well, we do want to play some more uh, Manchester bands. Uh, it's tough to do new wave music without having Manchester in there, but we uh, we will get back to shoegazing in March. So keep those nominations coming, and we do have one teed up for as soon as we get back to that. So please send them our way. Did you just say LOL? No. Oh, I thought you did. Although I will tell you. I thought you said LOL. When we saw LOL in the text Didn't messages, you say LOL? we did I not know what it. LOL meant. We had to look it up. And apparently neither did Huel Perkins. Oh, because, oh, re- oh, for Kwame's text message. Yeah, oh. because when he was reading, he just went, ha ha. Yeah. Well, what's he supposed to do? That's probably right. That's close, isn't it? Well, I mean. Do you remember the episode with Curb Your Enthusiasm where the person kept saying LOL, like saying it out loud? Yes. No. <laughs> No, but the one I can't stand is when people say, uh, hashtag, you're a loser, or that's taking the place of the you air quotes. You mean speak that out. Yeah, yeah, it's like, hashtag, this party's over. Oh, God. Like, hashtag, uh-huh. why to invite somebody who says hashtag before they say something that they want to say? But, uh, but yeah. Uh, Kyle. Uh-huh. Oh, damn that. Do you have, let's, let's get a little Huel. What? What do you want to hear? Do you have a little huge? Damn, huge? that. That one? Oh, there you go. Got them all. What'd yeah. Kyle say? Oh, he said, damn that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's more James Brown than uh, than uh, Hugh I Perkins. need you so bad. <laughs> I love the way he says Saturday. You remember, oh, I don't know that if one? I have that one. I want to have another night. I want to have Saturday at the residence. Wait, where'd the music go? It ran out. I want to what wake co- up in the morning, and you are there. Sad. I, I hear a device in the background. What Kyle said, yeah. I, I, I that really, sounds like a cat purring. I really like our guest, Mark. Very smart guy, but oh, yeah. he's such a lawyer. He didn't even want to read the sex messages in the text. Well, you know, when I mean, he was so focused on his job, I'm okay. sitting there. When he, what? Okay, what? Kilpatrick's bad. Well, what did oh Kyle say? Well, right. when, when we started reading the text messages, we, we put them in me. categories. And yes. we, we marked them with uh, with post-it notes, and we had a category that was romance. <laughs> romance. And after yeah, reading a, a couple of pages, there. we're like, we need a subcategory because it was yeah. like hardcore. You know, I mean, yep. it just, it got pretty salty. I, just, I, I appreciated that Mark was like so focused on the financial crime aspect of oh, it. Oh, yeah. No. Which is why he does that job because I would just be digging in. I don't care about that. Let's hear the well, sex. Well, and, you know, the reason we wanted them was not because we wanted to know whether they're having an affair. We wanted to see if there were yep. indications that there was public corruption. Uh, yep. And that we just did happened to be that. in there. Yeah. yeah. And, and Jennifer Dixon and I spent weeks going through city records to try and match it, it, events up to text messages. And we did, and in the end, when you look at the indictment, it read very much like the work that was published in the Free Press, which is, you know, Jennifer is working on another killer investigation right now. The Free Press, 33 cents a month now. Please subscribe, freep.com. Come on, man, help us out. Love you. So here's what Kyle said. Man, you did a great job with the questions you asked. I was initially excited, but this whole project is sweetheart deal for the wealthy, which I get. Is part of the perks of being a billionaire, but it's bullshit. And Kyle's referring to last week's episode, Billionaire Bonanza, where J.C. Rindell, the Free Press, came on and broke down some of the benefits that the uh, Illich family and the Rosses are looking for to put another $1.5 billion in developments into Midtown Detroit. Kyle Damn says. That. And the, I think Kyle's with you on that one, Huel. The reason the jobs are going to pay ninety-five grand is because that is what it costs to live there. <laughs> a simple bureaucrat like myself will never be able to live there unless I marry money. Then I will be the next Sean Windsor. Just wanted to tell a joke at his expense. <laughs> Love the show. I don't disagree with him. That's what Kyle says. That's nice. Sean yeah. did marry very well. Thank you, Kyle. Love you. And that's it for another oh, week. Wow. Unless, okay. Although, well, Sean, Sean, no, no, we're, we're, else, we're, Sean? no, we're done. We had uh, we had some nice odds and ends. We had a, a nice guest. We we started reasonably on time. No, it's been it's been great. Had a health update uh, brought to you by Kaiser Permanente. Yeah, a little, little, yeah, a little, like you said, odds and ends. So we're we're doing all right. Okay. Nothing, nothing to tease for the the Carlos yeah. and Sean podcast. Yeah. What are you gonna do after the Super Bowl? There's nothing to talk about. Yeah. No. We we've been trying to. to the Pistons suck. The Red Wings the, uh, suck. I'm going to see the Wings Tigers tonight. Suck. Actually. I'm gonna go see the Wings tonight. tonight. Yep. 
I thought they're playing. Oh, they're playing again Thursday, right? Yeah, they're playing tonight. Cal- uh, Calgary. Edmonton is. Yeah. Oh, so I'm gonna go see Connor McDavid. Connor McDavid, Lu- Lu- Leon Dreisaitl. How, how, a serious question: How does that bum you out? Because it's such it's such a dead period of sports. You know, not to give away too much uh, proprietary information. When Big Ten ins- basketball inside both of the our free teams press stink, but we sure. do have. Uh, yeah, no, this is bleak. We we had a conversation recently about just how creative we're gonna have to get because. Well, the Lions, Lions rule the day. Yeah. Absolutely. And Michigan football, uh, you know, does a lot of selling of subscriptions for us, too. So Michigan can, State, not so much this year. But, yeah, no, it's – we, we've got – and the Tigers aren't going to be that good. So, no, we got a long way. April in the D. Yeah, how are you going to pitch? We, uh, we got the NFL draft. Pitchers and catchers report. Who's going to get excited about Matt Boyd's return? I know. we got the oh, NFL well, draft, yeah. which will help a little bit. That's and huge. then And then the, there's going to be so much interest in the Lions that even the little Ooh. Mini, mini camps. Oh, you know, you have, this will be interesting to see if this moves the needle. The USFL. Oh. That'll be, that'll be interesting. Now, look, we will, could will get. That, will that move the needle? You know what would be crazy is if Based the Pistons here. won the lottery and we get and, and we get Wemben Yama to cover. Mm-hmm. That would that would help. That would help. Do you think readers will care about the USFL? I mean, it's pro football. That's a good question. It's not that's good really, pro football, that's a but really it's good professional. It, you know what? Doesn't it depend on how many local former athletes are there? Like maybe former yeah, Lions maybe so. or former Wolverines or former Sparties. Yeah, maybe so. So I don't know. We're going to talk about the Lions on the on the um, the the podcast with Carl. So we're probably going to have Dave Burkett on. Kind of uh, looking at the playoffs and then measuring, you know, where the Lions need to go next to try to get to that hmm. level. What about the XFL? Is that done? Don't we have another league? No, that's, I think that's coming back, right? Is it? So yeah. we have the XFL and the USFL? Yeah, they'll eventually merge. Yeah, that sounds good. Now, <laughs> professionally, I know that as a sports good. fan, you want to see the Pistons get the best guys ever, but how do you feel when you the see Wings a guy too. with a very difficult name who could be the Pistons' <laughs> next draft pick? You mean in terms of spelling or pronouncing? Can he change in terms his name? Of either. Either, yeah. Can you well, change you, his you name get, the world be free or something? You get used to it, right? Really? Don't you? I yeah. can still not pronounce Giannis Antetokounmpo's name, so. Yeah, that's tricky. But Wembenyama, I think, is a little easier. Wembenyama? Wembenyama. You've been practicing. Wenmen, no, that's not. Uh, Show that's off. a little easier than Antetokounmpo, yeah. Everybody just calls him Giannis, right? Yeah, so. or the Greek freak. The Greek but freak. no, people don't call him that anymore. I don't know why. Yeah, Or who as knows? much. Maybe the maybe the freak is demeaning. It's not uh, woke enough or something. I don't know, Rick James. That was a high compliment from uh, from Rick James. <laughs> there's freaks and then there's super freaks. Yeah, <laughs> that's where you want to be. Well, next week we will be back with another great episode of ML Soul Detroit. In the meantime, you have lots of time on your hands. Please check out our other partners on the Red Shovel Network. That's the Drew and Mike podcast and Charlie Ladoff's No BS News Hour. Now coming to you twice a week. And we want to thank our sponsors, Luke Nowacki and David Hall of Hall Financial. Please patronize them. Please let them know how you found out about them. And for more information on them and all kinds of great stuff, please visit our website, mlsoulofdetroit.com. And until next week, we turn to our good friend Cyrus to take us out. Can you dig that? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? There was a Manoogian mansion that was... The city, a palace in which there is no king, no queen, no princes or dukes, but subjects all beholden to each other to make a better place to live. I choose to fight back. I want to tell you, Detroit, that you done set me up for a comeback.